So can you guys hear me all right? This is uh, broadcasting out. All right, good deal. I think I'm going to kind of stand here so you can see this. So uh, the first talk that I was asked to give today is an introduction to marine fish breeding or fish breeding 101. I've given this is the first talk I ever, I've ever, ever given. Uh, I've given this talk for five years now. So just a little bit of background for those of you who don't know me. I'm from Chicago originally, but I currently live in Duluth, Minnesota. It's not like I'm getting some feedback there. Um, been an aquarist for 30 years and uh, spent 25 as a marine aquarist and I think I'm going to turn this off. It's kind of, that's better. You still all hear me? Yeah. Alright, so um, uh, in that time I've worked uh, on the maintenance side of the industry, the retail, the wholesale, and even ran a, a tropical fish hatchery uh, specializing in African cichlids. Um, on the marine side of things, uh, in the last six or seven years, I've really focused my efforts on marine fish breeding. And to date, I've spawned 24 species of marine fish, and I've success successfully reared nine of them. Um, I'm the Mastin Aquarius of the Year for 2009. Uh, I blog for Reef Builders and uh, Reefs.com. Uh, I also write a marine breeding series uh, that we just wrapped up uh, in the UK for Marine Habitat Magazine. Uh, I'm also a contributor, a senior editor, and associate publisher for Coral Magazine and the new freshwater version, Amazonas Magazine. Um, and I'm an MBI member, and I'm wearing the MBI shirt today. It's the Marine Breeding Initiative. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so here's what I'm going to cover in this talk. I'm going to talk about why we want to breed marine fish. Uh, we're going to talk about how you get started. Uh, I'm going to give you a big chunk of this presentation. It's going to be the fish. And we're going to cover this real broad range of stuff that's really easy, onto the stuff that's really difficult, and the stuff we don't yet know how to do. Uh, we'll recap with some resources, uh, run through just everything we've talked about, and I'll open it up for questions. So I'd ask that you please keep your questions until the end. Uh, just keeps things flowing. <clears throat> so marine breeding, when I started as a, as a hobbyist some 30 years ago, it was really like pie in the sky who's breeding marine fish. Yeah. But these days, there have been over 200 species of marine fish that have been spawned and reared at least once. So that's roughly 10 to 15% of the fish that we bring in and use in the hobby. Um, and it's really important to make this distinction that tank raised is not captive or tank bred. Tank raised fish are fish that are taken out of the ocean, generally at a post larval stage, very small, reared up to a saleable size. That's what tank raised means. And you see this used a lot to uh, imply that the fish are captive bred, and that's not the case. Only if it's captive bred or tank bred is it actually spawned and reared 100% captivity. And then there's even now this new thing, this captive condition, which is basically just someone buying a fish that they would normally sell you straight away and just holding it, quarantining it, getting it feeding, and then sending it to you. So understand that those terms don't all mean the same thing. So why are we going to breed marine fish? Well, I like to look at it, you're breeding to be a pioneer. This is the final frontier of the marine aquarium hobby. So if you're going to go do something that no one else has done, this is one of the best places to do it. We also need to breed to preserve our future. Uh, we're not always going to be able to take fish out of the oceans for our aquariums. That's just a simple truth. Um, our reefs are dying. Our reefs are having some serious problems that we may or may not fix. So at some point, this may be the only option for the fish that we keep in our hobby is what we are able to breed ourselves in captivity. And I actually want to go back to this first slide. Uh, this usually isn't in the presentation, but this is a red-tailed shark. This is a freshwater species. This species, you can walk into any Petco, PetSmart, any fish store, and you'll probably see it swimming around. There may even be some swimming around the corner. Uh, this species is considered uh, to be extinct in the wild. But they're available in every, in every pet store because they are bred by the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands every year in Asia, just for the aquarium hobby. So that's kind of the, the ironic truth, is that the aquarium hobby does serve to some, some extent as an art. The only reason the species still exists is because people keep it in their aquariums. So this is what we're up against. This is what's happening to the reefs around the, around the world. The one way we can preserve this is to do it, and do it ourselves in captivity. So again, kind of to be more responsible. Long before we ever look at a future where we may not be able to go to the wild, we want to we wanna be more responsible about the fish we keep. This is a, a, just an example. This is Tom collecting fish down in Florida, and I got to go do this with him. Uh, you know, our fish are coming off the reefs. And then they come in and end up in your tank. So a good example, everything in this tank was produced in captivity with the exception of the fish. Still wild caught. 
a lot of our quarrels these days are cultured in captivity. But if we really want to round out and have a more responsible hobby, I feel it's in our best interest to try and focus on purchasing more captive bred fish, but that means we need more of them available. So that's another reason we need to start breeding more fish. Then there's this financial reward thing. If you're breeding fish and you're successful, you can raise hundreds of fish. You can raise thousands of fish. And you know that these guys retail for you know, anywhere between $20, and $30, $40. Pick something rarer, it's going to retail for a lot more. So there is the potential for financial reward if you're breeding fish. Now, it takes some business savvy. You're not just going to get rich quick, but there is that potential there. We also breed to establish rare varieties of fish. All of you guys are probably familiar with the black ocellaris, but you probably don't know that everyone you see in the hobby is captive bred. You don't see wild caught black ocellaris. And the reason you don't see them is because the place where the wild black ocellaris occurs, Darwin, Australia, is home to a lot of crocodiles, a lot of saltwater crocodiles. If you're a diver, a fish collector who's going out for black ocellaris, you are very literally, literally risking your life. You may not come back. So there's no point for anyone to go get black ocellaris from the wild anymore when we can get them from captivity. And so that's why it's commonly available now because of captive breeding. And by the same token, we have the McCulloch clownfish. Okay, ten were collected from the wild, one permitted collection, and that was it. So every McCulloch clownfish that we will ever see in the hobby is the direct result of captive breeding. We're not going to get them any other way. We cannot go back to the wild to get this species. So that's why this is still retail of four hundred, five hundred dollar fish. Um, and then there's fish like this, the lightning bird, one in existence that we know of, as far as being still alive. The only way at this point we get more of these is through breeding. Very simple. Assuming that it's genetic, we don't even know that yet. And then there's personal satisfaction, and this is why I breed. I don't breed to get rich. I don't breed for any number of other reasons. I breed because it's cool to do something new. It's cool to do something different. I get tremendous personal satisfaction out of it. This is a species first. It's the first person to ever breed near the harlequin file fish. No one else has done it. That's just a tremendous sense of satisfaction in doing something new, and I got something out of it. And it's not monetary. It's not uh, anything other than just that little, you know, bit of pride that you get that, hey, I accomplished something new. So here's how you're going to get started. And this is a, this is a very broad overview. I'm not giving you step-by-step -step recipes here. This is just a lot of, to get your, your, your interest going, to get you salivating and say, maybe I can do this. So it really takes less than you think. One of the big things we, I always tell people is start small and grow slowly. You don't need a dozen tanks. You can just start with a couple tanks. Uh, a lot of people get into it and they just ramp up and they, they instantly have this before they even know what they've really gotten into. You don't need to. Let, let your breeding <laughs> go organically. Um, and you're going to need a lot of special equipment for breeding. Uh, black brown tubs are one of the things you'll, you'll read about a lot. They make a, a better larval rearing environment than a square glass tank. Uh, microscopes are very essential because a lot of the breeding that happens in the marine world is very small. We're dealing with rotifers that are you know, 200, 300 microns in size. We're dealing with larval fish that might only be a millimeter or two millimeters in length. You can't observe those with the naked eye. You need to have a microscope. So when it comes to breeding marine fish, even something as simple as this little toy digital blue microscope, I think you can probably pick this up now for 50 bucks. Um, it's a handy tool to have. It always takes two to tango, at least two. Um, when I was back in retail, anyone who told me they wanted to put four centripede jarvy in a tank together, I would have kicked them out of my store and said, I'm not selling to you, it's irresponsible, you're an idiot. The common wisdom for a long time has been a lot of these fish are aggressive towards each other, keep one per tank. And I, I, I'm glad to see that in the last five, six years, we've really gotten away from that. We're getting to the point where we understand more about how fish interact, their social structures, and that has allowed us to put four centripede jarvy in a 25 gallon tank and not have them kill each other. But you're never gonna get any breeding if you're only in the habit of putting one of something into a tank. It's very simple. So we really need to just sit and look, at, look around at your fish that you already have. If you have one antheus, you're never gonna spawn that species of antheus. But if you have half a dozen living together, you're gonna get a harem. You're gonna have some spawning. It's gonna happen every night. Um, there are many special foods and enrichments that you'll need as a breeder. These are live phytoplankton cultures. Some people culture their own live phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is generally used to rear the foods that you're going to feed your, your baby marine fish. Um, this is a good example of a live phytoculture station. Um, every week, harvesting half of those, 
replacing them with sterilized water, uh, and then repeating the cycle every week. It's pretty, pretty intense, labor intensive to culture phytoplankton. I figured out for me it was about about eight hours a month of my time. So now I use frozen paste. I let someone else culture the stuff. Um, this is Roti Grow Plus. It's used for growing rotifers. It's exactly what it's used for. This is a one liter bag about this big, comes frozen. For me, it's a year to two year supply. So I'll see something like this and say, wow, that's $75, that's crazy. Or I could spend eight hours a month, plus spend roughly the same amount of money to get started. This is cheap. So uh, we use a lot of phytoplankton as well for something called green water technique, which basically allows um, the baby fish to have a better visual screen to, to hunt against. Oh, just tint the water with phytoplankton. The food that we put in the rotor first, the copepods, they consume the phytoplankton in the water. It keeps that food for the baby fish enriched and going. This is another good example of that green water technique up on closer scale. You can see the rotifers, one of those special foods that we'll have to culture. And this is a good example of one way. There's many ways to set up zooplankton culture stations. Uh, a lot of people use five gallon buckets. This is an old system I was running where I was in limited space. And rotifers are really the foundation, a lot of what we know how to do, come off of rotifers. Um, they're the first food. It's, it's, it's something that the fish, they need something moving, they need something with the proper nutrition uh, to stimulate that feeding response to get them growing. So you're going to have to learn to culture rotifers. And it's not terribly hard. And the nice thing is that if, if you're even going to culture rotifers right now, you can feed them to your reef tank. You can do lots of other things with them. You don't have to just culture them and throw them away when you're not using them. They have other values. And it's a really good idea as well to kind of have multiple people in your area culturing rotifers. So if you crash your rotifers, you can go back to say, oh, hey, can you start me up again? It doesn't take a lot to get them going. It doesn't take a lot to keep them going. Then there's things like decapsulated artemia cysts. These are just brine shrimp eggs minus the shell. It makes hatching very easy. Brine shrimp is one of the foods that we'll occasionally use as kind of a stepping stone in the larval food chain. So you're going to need brine shrimp eggs. Um, you might use coco pods. These are tigger pods. Um, all of the different coco pods that are starting to come out now from reed mariculture and algachen have some specific uses. And we're finding that coco pods are a nutritionally superior food for larval marine fish compared to brine shrimp. Brine shrimp aren't nutritionally appropriate. So coco pods are one of those things that if you're going to do the more challenging things, uh, for example, the pygmy angels I showed you earlier, we know that their first food is parvocolanus coco pod nopolii, the baby coco pods. So if you're going to rear, or at least try to rear pygmy angels at home, you're going to need to be raising the copepods that they eat. And this is a good example. This is Pseudodiamptomus. This is the copepod that's used to rear mandarins in commercial culture. And this is Parvocolanus. This is the copepod that's used to rear angelfish in commercial culture. <coughs> There's also larval feeds. This is uh, at David Durr's house. This is Odoheim. And this is little, you see it in the, uh, in the containers. You've got them labeled by size, A1, B1, C1, C2. These are larval rearing pellets, very fine, very small. This is the first prepared foods a lot of your larval marine fish will take. So you kind of notice spending a lot of time on food here. This is one of those big important things with rearing marine fish, having the right first foods and the right progression of foods until you get that fish to a saleable size. Um, and Selcon, so much of what we use with our marine fish, um, especially the brine shrimp as I mentioned earlier, doesn't necessarily have the right nutrition. And specifically, it's the HUFAs, the highly unsaturated fatty acids. So we also know them as omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Celcon is a concentrate of EPA, DHA, uh, vitamin C. A lot of people use this to treat nori for their tanks to make it more nutritious, to help with lateral line erosion. Um, but we also use it as an enrichment for rotifers, uh, as an enrichment for brine shrimp. There are many different types of HUFA enrichments out there. But it's another little piece of the puzzle, the nutrition puzzle for your baby fish that you're going to have on hand. So I like to say take your reef tank and make some adjustments. There's a few things we'll do, even if you're not going to set up a dedicated breeding environment. You're just going to take, you can use your reef tank as your first brood stock tank. Um, but there will be a couple things you'll change. You'll want to get the lights on timers. If you're not already on timers, you're going to need to get your lights on timers because a lot of the mating occurs tied to the day-night cycle. A lot of the, the fish hatch it in the evening. It's tied to a consistent day-night cycle. One of the other things I like to do is make sure all your pumps, all your filtration, uh, can easily be turned on and off. So instead of having 10 plugs to, to pull and then remember to put back, 
have it all in one power strip, you can just turn off. Uh, and the reason for that is if you're harvesting larval fish, harvesting spawns out of a tank, filtration is designed to take that particulate matter and put it in the filter and get it out of there. Well, we don't want to suck up our babies, so a lot of times you're going to need to shut down your tank's filtration. So make it easy. Um, you have to feed your fish. You have to stuff your fish full of high quality food. The reason is simple. If they don't have enough calories and nutrition to survive, they don't have enough to put extra into producing gametes, into producing eggs and sperm. But we run a lot of our reef tanks on a feed the fish a few times a week, don't feed them excessively because we don't want to pollute the tank, we, we don't want to harm the corals. Well, that's something we're going to have to just rethink. Because if you're not feeding the fish well, they're not going to produce good gametes when they go to spawn. So really quality foods and a lot of them. Feed your fish three or four times a day. Feed your fish to satiation at least once a day. Stuff them full of a variety of foods. Because if any one food is missing something, hopefully you'll, you'll get it in one of those other foods that you offer. And then one of the most important things is to start watching your tank at night. A lot of the spawning and mating and hatching occurs after the lights go out. Uh, we were sitting at a local reefer's uh, house up in Duluth and he's had a 300 gallon reef running for years and just sitting there in the evening having a beer and I noticed, well, you've got this kind of antheus and another kind of antheus and they look like they're courting and he kind of says, no, no, they're not doing anything. I said, you watch, five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, everyone in your tank's gonna be eating even though you didn't throw any food in. Sure enough, five, 10 minutes later, all the fish are going crazy because the anthea spawned. And then, meanwhile, in the back, the other pair is starting to do something, so they're gonna go next. And sure enough, another 10, 20 minutes later, the fish are all eating again like crazy. A lot of this stuff happens as your lights cycle down in the evening or after they go out. So, that might mean shifting your lighting schedule. If you go to bed at nine, but you wanna breed marine fish, your, your light might need to go out at seven. You might have, need to have a couple hours of darkness that you can observe what's going on, see what's going on, and be there. Because otherwise, you're staying up until midnight when you would like to be in bed at night. So keep that in mind. A lot of this stuff happens at night when you don't normally see it. Most people don't wash their tank after the lights go up, but that's when a lot of this stuff happens. So this next section is going to be the, the big section. This is going to be a, a look at most of the marine fish that we keep that are suitable or potentially suitable for the hobbyist to breed at home. I'm going to take a quick, quick drink here. So we're going to cover the easy to breed species. And the easy to breed stuff can generally be reared off of nothing more than baby brine trout. And right off the bat, Bangai cardinal fish. A lot of people consider the Bangai cardinal fish the guppy of the marine world. It's not quite the guppy of the marine world, but it's an easy species to rear because the babies are kept in the male's mouth for almost uh, 24, 25 days. These are nine day Bangai cardinal fish eggs. These are in artificial incubation, but you'll be able to see the uh, development. So these are 20 days old. These still would not have been let out. So Bangai's tend to have small batches, 20 to 50 fish uh, per shot. They spawn once a month. They're a paternal mouth brooder. The male holds the eggs uh, in his mouth and doesn't eat. And when they come out like this, they're ready to go. Really easy to start onto even some people will go straight onto frozen cyclopes. Uh, you can use copepods and brine shrimp. All these live foods, these bigger foods, they're ready to eat. That's what makes them easy. Um, but they have problems. Males don't like to hold. Uh, they can just be problematic to pair. Uh, they tend to be monogamous. They're very atypical for cardinal fish. And Mike and I were talking about this last night because he has some other cardinal fish going. Bangai cardinal fish are really the only cardinal fish you're going to encounter that have what we call direct development. And all the fish in this group have direct development. Their larvae do not have a pelagic phase. They don't go up into the water column, float around for a while with the plankton, and then settle back to the reef. When the male Bangai cardinal fish lets those babies out, they stay there. They're little fo fully formed juvenile fish ready to go. None of the other cardinal fish that you're going to encounter are like this. So these are uh, 83 days post-spawn. They're almost market size at this point. Uh, they grow quickly. They're a great species to work with but they are atypical. The spiny chromus and anthochromus polyacanthus is a uh, damselfish. And it's another atypical fish for its family. Most damselfish are not like the spiny chromus. The spiny chromus lays uh, large nested demersal eggs and the juveniles, the babies as they hatch out, will actually feed off the parent's slime much like a discus. 
much like those fish swimming around behind you. Uh, atypical for marine fish. So because they lack that pelagic phase, they, and because they have parental care, they're much easier to rear than your average marine fish. And they're much more like many of the freshwater fish that we breed. Another good example is the convict worm blenny, or eel, or goby. We have so many different names uh, for this fish. Um, if you want to breed something that looks like an eel, this is your best chance. Uh, these guys, we don't know how to sex them, we don't know how to tell them apart, but if you put a half dozen in a larger tank together and let them figure it out, and just feed them like crazy and let them live, they'll surprise you one day with 300 to 600 babies that are like this. They're big. They're easy to rear. They don't spawn frequently. Uh, Ellen Fowler says hers spawn just a couple times a year, but they have these big nests of babies, and they're really easy to rear. So it's a, it's a great way to get some success. You're gonna have to be patient, but it'll pay off, and it's something different and cool. Um, and then the only time I'm gonna talk about seahorses in this presentation are the easy seahorses. There are four species of seahorses that have benthic larvae. Uh, whitey eye, cuda, uh, barbara eye, which is shown here in Zeusteray. They always have benthic larvae. They don't have that pelagic phase. So you can get most of these species as captive bred fish, which makes keeping the brood stock very easy to begin with. Um, and by the same token, their babies come out ready to eat. Copepods, brine shrimp. You don't have to rear rotifers. You don't have to rear anything complicated. That's what makes the easy seahorses, those four, four species, good beginner fish. But again, no pelagic phase. Um, and that's it for the easy, easy, easy stuff. This next group, the moderate species, is a broad continuum. It starts over here with stuff that's still pretty easy, a lot like those first four. But all of these fish have a pelagic phase. Their larvae hatch out, move up into the plankton for a series of days or weeks, and then settle back to the reef as a juvenile fish. Um, at the end of the moderate species, we're bordering on stuff that some might consider be to be difficult. So there's this really broad range of stuff, and it's kind of laid out in order of difficulty. So clownfish, still an ideal beginner's fish for breeding. Um, the upside of the clownfish is they're in demand, they're easy to produce, they're well documented, probably the most documented marine fish. Um, these are quarter inch long baby, Ocellaris, probably uh, 30 days old, uh, maybe a little less. They start off with rotifers, go through green water, uh, nine to 10 days, and Ocellaris is settled out and starting to get its stripes. And can already be put straight onto the Odaheim foods I talked about earlier, these little larval pellets. Um, you get a lot of babies. It's very encouraging. Uh, when I started, I think by my third spawn I got eight babies, by my sixth spawn I had 100 or something. It's easy to get success, and success keeps you interested. Uh, I would not necessarily say that clownfish are necessarily the best beginner's fish because you may be waiting a period of months or even years before you get your first spawns. Um, something like a percula can take on average three years from the time it's hatched to be a fully functional female. Black ocellaris, four years. The blue stripe group, five years. So you buy your pair now, you might be sitting around several years before you get any spawning. Uh, it's a long time to wait. So there are many other fish that might be better because you might have a chance to get them quicker or spawn. Uh, the bristletail filefish, this is in a group by itself basically. Uh, it's an aptasia eater. Happens to not like to be shipped around the country. He's easily sexable. You can tell the males and the females apart because the males will have a really large bushy patch of clear bristles on the caudal peduncle right here and you can look down from above and clearly see it. The females lack that. So just an ideal marine fish for our tanks because they eat aptasia. Um, and a great fish for breeders because they have a larval period of about 15 days. So these guys will spawn in algae or they'll dig a pit in the sand and spawn in the sand. And those babies hatch out quickly, they grow up quickly. The very short larval span makes them easier to keep alive. And again, gets you to that point where you have success. This would be a great fish for someone to try and breed. They're not expensive, but it's not about making money at this point. The dotty backs are another group that are really still accessible at this point to beginner breeders. Uh, the problem we have with dotty backs is that they tend to be aggressive towards their mates. Uh, some of the more aggressive species, like the blue bars, this male ultimately wound up killing this female. Um, most of the dotty backs are hermaphrodites. Some of them are even bi-directional hermaphrodites. They can start off, for example, in the blue bars, they start off as female, uh, they turn into a male, but you can even turn a male back into a female, and that's exactly what was done with this one. 
Uh, but they had to be housed separately and only brought together for spawn. Um, and a fantastic looking dotty bag, probably my favorite out of all the ones I've ever tried. Um, these are three day old blue bar dotty bags. This is a, um, a white five gallon bucket. This is not a good rearing environment, but it's what I had on hand at the time. Uh, and you can see the little babies all sitting right, right in there. Now again, all you need to rear these with is rotifers. They have a longer larval phase than some of the clownfish, uh, but they're still within the realm of possibility. Uh, these are 23-day-old sunrise audibacks, the Red Sea species. Really accessible, something to do that it's not a clownfish. And if you're going to start with something like audibacks, you can get them spawning in a couple weeks, a couple months sometimes. Make a much more accessible fish than a clownfish. This is, to give you an idea, a newly settled one-month-old sunrise audibac. And that segues into the next group, which is the gobies. And the gobies are this tremendous continuum of species. They are, in themselves, some of the easiest to the most difficult to the fish we've never done before. Um, but the neon goby is a great beginner breeder fish. You can get them spawning in a matter of weeks. You can go buy wild caught pairs that are ready to go. They don't have a long lifespan, only a year or two. But you get 100 eggs uh, easily, sometimes a few hundred eggs, every week. So they make up for it by spawning a lot. And species like the, the uh, neon goby, the shark nose goby, these are readily accessible, readily available. They don't take a lot of space. You can easily house the brood stock in five and a half gallon tanks with a pair of clownfish. Um, you can double down and keep multiple types of brood stock together. But then there's the clown gobies, and the clown gobies have been spawned and reared, but we found that these guys have a larval lifespan, a, a pelagic phase of over a month. Uh, they require smaller foods. Uh, they're more difficult, they're more touchy. They're within the realm of possibilities, but they wouldn't be the first goby I would try. Uh, this was the first goby that I did, the green bandit goby. You don't see these around too often, but a fantastic goby. And uh, this male, by the time he was old, he was about this big, which is about double the size they're supposed to get to. Uh, lived for about two years, spawned every week. Just a fantastic fish, totally cool fish, great for nano tanks. Um, gobies are a great place to start with your breeding. And all these gobies can be reared with green water technique, putting phytoplankton in the larval water, along with rotifers. Those are the ones we know how to do. Um, one other thing I want to say about the gobies is this is, we're getting to the point where we're starting to deal with fish that if you tried to rear them in a regular standard 10 gallon tank, uh, even if you black out the sides, it probably won't work, or it'll be much more difficult, or it will lower your chances of success. Those black round tubs that I showed you earlier um, just make a superior rearing environment. There's no edges you're able to control circulation better. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little more maybe in the second presentation. Uh, but this was the first species of fish I ever did. I was told this was a pretty hard species to do. But it's not anymore because we know how to do it. When I had my green banded goby spawning, I talked to someone who had done it. And that's a big help because he was able to say, yeah, for these guys, you need to use live TISO, and they're going to take 28 to 30 days to settle out. And you really have to be careful with this. And if you can put in coconut pods, it'll help. Sure enough, I did it. So if I can do it as my first fish and I can tell you how I did it, that means it's still within the possibilities as a first fish for you. And the blennies are another one of these groups where we have a few types that we've done and many types we haven't. This is the Red Sea uh, Mimic blenny, Exineus graveri. It mimics the, one of the uh, Red Sea fang blennies, one of the uh, venomous ones. And I had these spawn twice. Uh, you can see a little nest of eggs right there. So we presume that's the male that's guarding them. Um, I was actually forced to give these fish away because they were eating my wife's favorite coral, which is extremely dumb because now they sell for about $100 and you can't find them. So I did do Meacanthus Kundu, one of the fang blennies. And the fang blennies are one of those groups that are really accessible at this point, and mostly through captive breeding. They're not always really rock solid fish when you bring them in from the wild. But when you buy them captive bred, as long as you feed them frequently, they're plankton pickers, uh, they'll, they'll do quite well and they will lay lots of eggs for you. And I think it only took me three months to get my first spawn out of my pair, uh, out of my group of boon dunes. Um, these are boon dunes in a black round tub. Um, see the rotifers floating on by. They all look like little tadpoles in there. Uh, and this is a month and a half later. Little baby boon dune blenny. Um, rel relatively speaking, the Meacanthus blennies are very accessible to, uh, to new breeders. And you can go out, you don't know necessarily how to sex them. Uh, there are some differences when you look at them closely. 
But generally, the, the, the thought is you buy four to six of them, put them in a larger tank like a 29 or a 40 breeder, let them pair off, let them figure it out, and then start pulling the nests when they start laying. The marine beta is still something in theory possible for a beginning breeder. The problem with marine betas is that they're unreliable spawners and they can be aggressive towards each other. So you might put four in a 200 gallon tank and wait and wait and wait and might never get eggs. Uh, males are notorious for eating the eggs once they've been spawned. So you, if you get eggs, you might have to get them out of the tank right away. But if you can get past all that, if you can get past the hard part of getting them to spawn, of getting those eggs out, they're actually quite easy to rear. So still within the relative realm of possibilities for a beginner. And royal grandmas. <laughs> royal grandmas are really cool because they spawn every day. They don't spawn a lot of eggs. Uh, the male builds a nest out of calerpa and other bits of algae. And they might only spawn 15 or 30 eggs a day. But they spawn every day, which means there is a hatch every day. Which means if you feel like breeding royal grandmas today, pull the babies out. If you don't, eh, don't worry about it. There'll be more tomorrow. I like that because <laughs> it really allows the fish to be flexible and work on your schedule. You want to go away for two weeks and not deal with bring babies, no worries, they'll still be making babies when you get back. We don't have a consistent idea on how to pair up uh, and form royal grandma pairs. But it almost doesn't matter because it's a very affordable fish. You can go out and buy a half dozen of them, let them sort it out, pull, separate out pairs as they form. Um, some people believe that they are hermaphrodites, uh, that are sequential hermaphrodites. Other people believe that the way royal grandmas work is they, when they settle out to the reef, they kind of take stock of the royal grandmas that are around them. And if there were mostly males, they will become females. If there were mostly females, they would become males. Uh, it's a sexual determination at settlement. There are a few fish that are documented to work that way, and that's the current working theory with royal grandmas. So if you were really stuck strapped on a budget and said, I want to breed royal grandmas, but I don't want to buy a half dozen of them. The best advice I can give you is get from a single group, get one of the largest ones and a couple of the smaller ones. And hopefully you're getting a male and a couple females. The cardinal fish with the pelagic larva. Told you earlier that the bad guys are atypical. The rest of the cardinal fish have hundreds of eggs. And they have pelagic larva. They don't incubate for three plus weeks. They incubate oftentimes for seven to 12 days. Um, this is one of the cardinals I tried and never could get viable eggs, but I did manage to do leptocanthus, a pod and leptocanthus, the, the blue streak. Uh, you can see the eggs here in the male's mouth. So again, the fundamental difference here is the babies are much more numerous and they are much, much smaller. Uh, we believe you can rear them with rotifers. It's been done. This is getting to the point now where you need to probably put some copepods in the mix to help with the nutrition. Copepod and ophelii, the babies are generally far more nutritious than a rotifer. Um, but these are post-settlement, post-metamorphosis. And to give you an idea, those of you who know what a baby clownfish is, this is probably a, a six or seven day old clownfish. And the rest of these are 40 some odd day old cardinal fish. The babies are much smaller than a, than a clownfish. That makes them much more difficult to rear. And uh, a much longer pelagic phase, just again, makes them much more difficult to rear. But I did these still in a 10 gallon tank. You can see the black plastic on the back to kind of black out the sides. Um, the reason we want opaque sides, we don't want light coming in from anywhere other than above. That's a standard protocol in all marine fish breeding. Because in the ocean, there's only one source of light that's up there. The jawfish. The nice thing about the jawfish is they've been done. There is some documentation on them. These are another uh, parental mouth brooder. The male is the one who holds the eggs in his mouth. You can go out and get wild caught pairs of jawfish, uh, pearly jaws specifically. One of the downsides is per pearly jaws don't have a long lifespan. Their natural lifespan is two to three years. Uh, in the ocean, especially like in Florida, they are also seasonal breeders. They breed in the winter. So January, February, March, April. So if you were gonna try to do your jawfish at home, you might have to play with temperature, play with lighting to kind of tell them, hey, it's winter, it's time to spawn. And you're only going to get a year or two off that brood stock before you're going to have to replace it. Um, a lot of these fish, uh, Banga cardinals, for example, their natural lifespan is about six years at the max. But their productive lifespan as a breeding fish is only about two. So the downside to jawfish is they're relatively short-lived. 
you get a limited window of opportunities to get eggs and to get something to happen. But if you can do it, they've been done. And then the damselfish. The damselfish are the last of this moderate group, and they're, they're bordering on the edge of being really difficult. Um, certain species like the yellowtail blue, uh, Chrysoptera parasima, has been done. It's been done a few times now. No one's breeding this because there's no money in it. It's going to cost you more to produce this fish than it currently retails for. But stark eye damsels are the same genus, should be the same exact rearing protocols. This is a fish that sells for 40, 50 bucks usually. So sometimes you can take what you learn on a cheap fish and apply it to a not cheap fish. Um, I'm actually currently working with stark eyes. I know they're spawning, I can't find their nests. Um, a lot of the damselfish have very small eggs. This whole cloudy area on this underside of the rock, these are all eggs. You can see these little tiny white dots at the tips of the eggs. These eggs are under two millimeters in length. They're tiny. This is Neopomus centris numerus. Uh, green chromis. A lot of people spawn green chromis. They have huge nests. The entire back area that I'm circling with the, with the cursor, that's all green chromis nests in this photo. You'll, you'll see it a little bit better in the next picture. All these little dots, all over, those are all green chromosomes. There are thousands of them. All these little tiny, tiny things covered the entire back of the tank. And they would do this every four or five days. But these are all about a millimeter in diameter. They are tiny. And when they hatch out, they hatch out as something we call a prolarva. They hatch out having no eyes, no mouth, no gut. They spend another two days developing before they even could start feeding. So no one's done green chromis yet. No one's cracked that secret yet. Now the upside is no one's cracked that secret yet. If you want to try doing something that no one else has done, green chromis are quite, quite accessible. And if you can get a group of them spawning, have at it. Someone's going to do it. But that segues into the difficult group. And the difficult group, this is fish that have been done. Uh, but they all have this prolarval phase. They all have this extended larval phase. Most of these fish have a larval phase that's in, that we measure in months. Um, every one of these groups has at least one representative species that's been done in captivity. The other thing that many of these difficult fish have uh, is that they're pelagic spawners. All the fish that we've talked about so far have been benthic spawners. They'll lay their eggs on the ground, or they'll put their eggs down and the male will pick them up, or they'll, they'll do something else with them. They'll put them in algae. The pelagic spawners, move up into the water column and broadcast their eggs, and their eggs just float away. The eggs are buoyant, and they're just like seeds in the wind thrown, thrown to the wolves to fend for themselves. So again, the pearl larva that I talked about, no eyes, no mouth, no gut, no gills even. They're just like a big yolk sac and a spinal cord. That's it. And over the next couple days, they'll use this big reserve of fuel, this big fat reserve or oil reserve, to power further development to become a first feeding juvenile fish. And to give you an example, the one here on the left, this is a, a Syncheropus, a uh, mandarin, after hatching. And the one on the right here, this is a Centripede argi after, ha after hatching. These guys, their eggs don't incubate for seven to 10 days. Their eggs generally incubate for a day, day and a half, maybe two days. Smaller eggs mean smaller incubation time, smaller larva, more difficulty, longer pelagic phase, we're the difficult group. So again, the dragonets. The dragonets, all the dragonets at this point that we commonly find in the hobby have been reared at least once. Um, they're pelagic spawners, they make a nice spawning rise up into the water column, generally at dusk, and they broadcast a few hundred eggs at a time. If they're in really excellent condition, they'll spawn every night. So again, one of the nice things, they have these small eggs, but they drop them down all the time. Any day you feel like, in theory, you should be able to start a rearing project on mandarins. Another nice thing with the mandarins and scooter bunnies and, and all the dragonets is that they're sexually dimorphic. It is readily apparent which are male and females. Generally, it's part of the first dorsal fin. They'll have the two dorsal fins coming off their back. It's generally the first one that differentiates your males from the females. In the uh, scooter bunnies, uh, both the red and the regular, they have a real, the males have a real big flag-like dorsal fin that's all scrawled, it has ocelli all over it. The females have a little tiny black fin with a little white edge. They look totally different. In the mandarins, 
Uh, general rule, the male will have an elongated first dorsal spine unless he's lost it, unless it's been damaged or been, you know, bit off in competition or become eroded. Generally, the male will have that elongated spike, the female won't. <coughs> and uh, these days, you can even get captive bred mandarins. Uh, one of the problems with the captive bred mandarins is people look at them and say, oh, it's captive bred, it's going to do fantastic, it's going to eat anything. It's not really the case. It's not really the case. They are still mandarins. They still have mandarin requirements in terms of husbandry. They still are slow feeders. They're not going to hunt down food as it's floating through the water column, uh, chasing and fighting a tang off to, to get their food. Uh, a lot of people are putting these fish in high flow tanks, high energy tanks, SPS tanks. They're offering them foods they're not familiar with, and they're having just horrible success rates with them. But the reality is, is these fish are eating prepared foods. They're eating Nutramar ova, uh, Spectrum small pellets, at the hatchery and ORA. So you have to start them on those foods when you get them. Uh, and you have to let them settle into your tank, not put them with species that are going to outcompete them. But it's a great, tremendous shortcut to getting a breeding project going, is starting with the captive bred ones. The next group is the harlequin file fish. Um, this is my species first. This is the one where I said I'm going to do something no one else has done, and I actually did it. They are still SPS feeders. They are still very difficult to keep alive. Um, I just want to jump back for one second. But the harlequin file fish is a really nice species because it's easy to tell the males and the females apart. The males have a brightly colored <coughs> ventral flap that's bright orange with a thick black border around it that's speckled with white spots. The females lack that thick black border and their ventral flap is generally either kind of a, a rusty orange or a darker color or a gray or a black. So it's really easy to tell the male and the female apart. That's one of the great things about them. You know if you got a pair. Getting them to live is another story. Getting them to spawn is still another story, but these guys spawn every day. The harlequin files put their eggs down in algae. They are not a, a pelagic spawner, but their eggs are very much on the scale of all the pelagic spawners. These are 0.8 millimeters in diameter. They are tiny. All these little dots in here, these are oil globules. These are the energy reserves for this baby fish. This is what they hatch out like. Uh, this is newly hatched. You can tell where the eyes are going to be, you can tell where the mouth is going to be, but this is a prolarva. And it takes another couple days, three days, before they're ready to eat. And you can already see that dorsal spine that file fish have starting to form. And this is what they look like in eight days. And these were, these were lucky. We reared them on rotifers, first. Um, and that's all they took. But they have a very long pelagic phase. This is 40 days, and you can see, you can see the shape. You can see that's all happened, but it's still kind of a translucent fish. Um, they actually settle out around 55, 56, 60 days. So two months they would spend floating around in the ocean. So to give you an idea, this is 42 days post-hatch. Um, this one is 56 days post-hatch. This was the first one I did. He was on brine shrimp. He's actually kind of stunted now. Uh, we found that brine shrimp really didn't work as an ideal long-term food for these babies. They needed to get on to other things like spirulina. So this one, while being younger, is actually outpacing this one in this photo. So it is possible, not easy. No one's repeated my success yet, but I want someone to. So you know, I shared exactly how I did it with the world. Angelfish. It is conceivable that someone could, at their home, breed it in rear angelfish. The technology is out there. The information is out there. It just takes the determination and will to actually fail, 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 fail some more, and then maybe you get lucky and you pull it off and you learn, and maybe that success builds, you learn from your mistakes, and over time, you could potentially be another angelfish breeder. Um, the nice thing about the angelfish is, as far as we know, they're all sequential hermaphrodites. They all start life as females, and then the terminal sex is male. So when you get something like Centropy Jargi, if you get a, a few small ones, Eventually in that group, one of them is going to become the dominant fish and that fish will become the male. If you want to speed up the process, get a couple small ones and one big one. And the big one will be the male. And the small ones will stay female. Social pressure is what keeps those fish from turning into males themselves, within reason. Sometimes eventually an angelfish will get old enough where I've been around for six years, I'm gonna be a male and that's a problem that can happen. So that's how my quartet of angelfish turned into a trio. The largest female said, I'm turning into a male now, and the male killed her. But angelfish spawn every day. Every day, any day of 
any evening I want to go into my basement and try angelfish, I just have to shut off my pumps, wait for them to spawn, and collect the eggs. Every day. They've been doing it every day for, I think, six years now. <clears throat> really cool. Um, they have pelagic eggs. They, they have a long uh, larval phase. Um, we know that the centripede oftentimes take two to three months to settle out. And I mentioned it earlier, parvocolanus is the copepod that's used to rear angelfish uh, in small-scale commercial production. The, the genacanthus or genacanthus angelfish are really nice because they are sexually dichromatic. You know the males from the females. And again, because they're hermaphrodites, if you were to purchase a few swallowtails, the largest, most dominant fish is going to turn in the male. And you can see this one back here starting to get the male coloration. And now, we're even starting to think we would never do big angels in, in captivity. It, for the home hobbyist, it's not reasonable. But it turns out that you can pair up the larger pomacanthids as well. We have a, a couple documented cases of regal angelfish spawning in large reef tanks. Um, so it is possible that we could have some of the bigger angels. I'm working with rock babies right now. I, that was a species I said it's one of the smaller ones. But maybe we'll get it. We'll get lucky. I know that Martin Mo has has tried to rear these in the past, but that was 30 some odd years ago. Let's revisit the species. So angelfish are definitely within the realm of possibility. It's not easy, but it is possible. And now we're going to get into the unknown fish. For the most part, the unknown fish are probably a lot like the difficult stuff, and we just don't know enough about it yet to have succeeded with any of them. So. Firefish are one of those fish, they're, they're ubiquitous in the hobby, a lot of people have them. Uh, there's no way to tell the males and the females apart. You generally have to look at a group and watch how they behave. The aggressive ones tend to be the males, the ones they display to and don't try to kill, those are the females. Um, they don't live too terribly long, but they'll live long enough. We know they're cave spawners. We know they spawn in caves, so an ideal bird stock setup would be a tank with nothing but PVC pipe sections. Check the sections every day, you'll find the eggs you'll be able to start working with them. Um, but no one's yet reared a firefish. So all the firefish are out there fair game for someone to make a breakthrough. And it might just be that trying one of those newer foods, like the parvocolanus or the pseudodiamatomus coke pods that are now available, one of those could be the magic bullet. Or not, we don't know. Uh, lionfish. Lionfish uh, can, in theory, be spawned at home. The dwarf lions are, we know, uh, they're heremic. Uh, generally, they live in a group of one male and a couple females. The dwarf lions, we even know how to sex them. Um, they spawn infrequently, but they spawn tons of eggs. So we know they're pelagic spawners. This big egg raft kind of goes up there, and babies go everywhere, and then you're on your own. Nothing else I can tell you on how to rear a lionfish at this point. The reef basslets, uh, like the Serranus specifically, these are really cool. This is one of my projects. Uh, this is an orange back basslet. The Ceranus are simultaneous hermaphrodites. They are both male and female at the same time. So to get a pair, you buy two. Done. Um, and the Ceranus are basically just mini groupers. We know they're pelagic spawners. We know they have small eggs. But it's possible that the food culture technologies that we use to rear groupers for food may well apply <laughs> to rearing mini groupers for our aquariums. So really, this is one of those things that I think in the future we will be able to do, the Ceranus. And then some of the other reef bassets, for example, the Leo Propomas, uh, Todd Gardner was the first last year to sex, uh, successfully rear a Leo Propoma. Uh, kind of unrelated, but we call them reef bassets. Um, it's possible the Ceranus are going to be a relatively easy fish to do. Someone has to try. Someone has to go read up on grouper culture figure out how they do it for groupers, and then apply that technology to the reef baskets. Hawkfish, we know are pertangious hermaphrodites. Uh, again, they start out life uh, as one sex, they go to the other. Uh, you get two of a different size, as long as they aren't too different, but different enough, you'll have a pair. It's relatively simple, you just have to watch, watch for aggression. We know that they are pelagic spawners. Beyond that, we don't know what to do. This is uncharted territory. But they are related to the Antheus, and people are starting to work with the Antheus. And again, the Antheus, we all know, uh, again, they're, they're hermaphrodites, they live in harems. Get a half dozen Antheus, for the most part, put them in a tank together. You're going to have a male, you're going to have a female, you're going to have spawning. It's going to occur if they're in good condition every night. Ripe territory for experimentation. 
And since they are kind of in that same family as things like the Saranus, it's possible that grouper food fish technology could apply to the Anthias. Certainly possible. Brasses, another field wide open. Uh, people have been trying with brasses, they just haven't figured it out yet. Um, but I'm going to go on record and say a couple years from now that might be a different story. Uh, there's some good news, I can't tell you about it yet, but brasses, maybe a couple years from now, will be at the very top of what we can do, maybe. Um, but brasses are nice because if you get a bunch of females, put them together, you'll end up with the male and females. You'll get spawns frequently, possibly every day. They're pelagic spawners like most of the fish in this group. Collect the eggs anytime you want, try to rear them. It's open territory. The butterfly fish are my, they're my next target. They're my next impossible dream, can I do it? Um, we don't know a ton about butterfly fish. Uh, we assume that they are conicorous, which means they have fixed sexes. So unlike most of these fish where we said, oh, just get a group of young ones or some size difference and then it'll, it'll work out, butterfly fish don't fit that model. So that makes getting a pair rather difficult. Butterfly fish tend to not like each other. I've learned that the hard way. They can actually be quite aggressive with each other, unless they're a collected pair. Unless they are collected that way, or you take the time, you have to go through a half dozen fish easy just to mix and match until you have a compatible pair. And then it, it turns out that in the wild, sometimes that, that compatible pair in the wild is two fish of the same sex. They might just be buddies. So butterfly fish have this big disadvantage right off the get uh, the get go that it's hard to even establish brood stock. Um, I work with Ketodon capistratus. Uh, it's one of my favorite fish. I have multiple groups of these going now. Uh, also working with long nose, friendly eye. Patience is a big key here. I've had my my, my uh, capistratus, my four eyed butterflies, going for a couple of years now. And they're only now reaching the size where they should be sexually mature. They're going to be pelagic spawners. Uh, they're going to have small eggs. Uh, the Rising Tide Conservation Initiative uh, succeeded in getting some butterflies recently to about 40 days post-settlement, which was like a, a kick in the gut and yet terribly exciting at the same time. Because here I am trying to do it, I don't even have eggs yet, and they've already got juveniles. Uh, but they didn't make it. They, they got close. They got real close. So butterfly fish, next two to three years, would not be surprised if we hear about the first captive bred butterfly fish. Um, and so that, that's it. There's other groups of fish we could talk about. I don't have tangs in this presentation, and I thought about sliding them in real quick because for a long time we said there's no way people are going to even spawn tangs in a home aquarium. They're just too big, they, they're too aggressive. Well, I have to eat those words because people are now spawning uh, Paracanthus uh, hepatis in tanks as small as 200 gallons. So it is possible. It is possible. People have been trying to rear tangs for decades and have not succeeded. But uh, resources, where do you go to learn more about all this? Well, I will say library. I maintain a massive library of, of information. You don't always know when it's going to be relevant. Um, currently, the, the Complete Illustrated Breeder's Guide to Marine Aquarium Fishes by Matt Whitmerich. This is the Bible. This took about 40 years of breeding knowledge, threw it in a book, uh, covers some 90 species. This is an excellent resource to start. It's going to tell you about green water tech, uh, technique. It's going to tell you about how to rear the various types of phytoplankton. Uh, it's going to cover brood stock nutrition, as well as recipes on how to breed dozens and dozens of fish. And sometimes that's what people need as a breeder. They need a roadmap. Um, Clown fishes is now out of print, uh, which is sad because now it costs about $100 plus dollars when you can find it. Uh, but if you're going to breed clownfish, this is a must-have book still, because you can go start to finish and learn everything there is to know. This book is still, still highly relevant. It's some 12 or 13 or 14 years old now, and it's still the default best book on clownfish. Um, if you're going to go beyond just rearing rotifers or growing a little phytoplankton, uh, Frank Hoff's Plankton Culture Manual tells you how to do all sorts of neat stuff. It also tells you how to rear things like amphipods. Uh, it tells you how to spawn oysters. All sorts of neat, interesting things in this book. So if you're a person who's into the really tiny, tiny, tiny stuff, this is a great book. Um, if you're going to move beyond just being a hobbyist breeder, if you're going to go hawk wild, then Frank Hoff's uh, Conditioning, Spawning, and Rearing of Marine Fishes with an emphasis on marine clownfish is a really good book. It's a dry read. It's a difficult read because it's a technical read. This is a brain dump. Frank Hoff ran instant ocean hatcheries. 
all that information when they closed it up went into the book. So it wasn't lost. Um, if you're going to breed Dottybacks, Breeding the Orchid Dottyback in Aquarius Journal by Martin Moe is a fun read. It's not a how to, it's a how I did it. Um, because this was back when they were just starting to learn how to breed the city promise. So this is like reading a really long forum post. It's a journal. It's a different approach to conveying information and experiences. And also seeing the failures. Because it's a really important part that I hope you all understand is that breeding reefish does embody a lot of failure, but that's what makes the successes that much more enjoyable. Um, there is a new edition out. I should swap this picture out with a new one. But the uh, Marine Aquarium Handbook, Beginner to Breeder. If you are not to the point yet where Wittenrich's book even makes sense for you, you just want a cursory look at breeding, want a good general aquarium book, Martin Moe's third edition is a fantastic book, go pick it up. Uh, and then the one I brought today, Reproduction of Reef Fishes. This is another out of print book. You can't find it new. This is a used copy I brought. I, uh, it's one of my favorite things to bring out to clubs because people don't think about this book. This book tells you how just about every fish does it. it tells you how wrasses do it. Uh, more eels. You want to know how eels pair and spawn and do what they do? It's in this book. It's out of date from the standpoint of being published in 1984, but fish biology hasn't changed. More eels didn't change because the book was written and said, oh, we're going to do it differently now. So this is a fantastic book. If you're wanting to just see what's out there, see what information is out there, get an idea. Um, so this is a book I, I think every reader who's really into it or just wants something totally different to read, uh, this is one to pick up. And then how to raise and train your peppermint shrimp. And I understand that peppermint shrimp are kind of a, a, a specialty down here in Houston. Um, this is a fun read. This, if you want to breed some inverts, peppermint shrimp are generally considered one of the easiest to do. The other interesting thing is that this book will give you some very interesting ideas on things you can try to apply to fish. Because peppermint shrimp have a pelagic larval phase just like a fish does. Uh, peppermint shrimp larvae are generally collected out of the tank. Um, and you can use that same technology to do it for fish. So it's a fun read, it's a different read. It gets your mind thinking. You, uh, you look outside the box, outside the fish world, you'll find things you can still apply to fish. Uh, and then periodicals. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a senior editor for Coral Magazine. This is the new one that is shipping. And it's very appropriate that this is the issue that's breeding successes. This is uh, how we, how Frank Hoff did the uh, crosshatch triggerfish. Uh, Felicia McCauley with the uh, clingfish, totally unique thing. Uh, Pomacanthus angels being done by rising tide. Uh, I have an article in there on collaborative breeding, basically shipping eggs from someone who's hatching, someone who's spawning them off to someone else who has larval culture experience and can rear them off site. Uh, really changing how the world is working. Um, the reason I put all these periodicals up here is because any, any number of these, is going to be where something like a species first is going to be heard about first. It's not going to get published straight into a book. You're going to maybe hear something about it online, and then the first time you're going to get that real information, that real useful technology or insight is going to be in a magazine, whether it's coral, a reef hobbyist, uh, tropical fish, uh, aquarium fish, marine habitat, ultramarine, practical fish keeping, and even going back to Sea Scope, which Sea Scope has been out of print more or less for a long time now. It's still a lot of the stuff that happened in the late 80s is in Cisco. So if you want to go see the first breeding of this or that or the other thing, it might be in Cisco where it was documented. And then of course the online resources. There are numerous places. Uh, the Breeders Registry is another one of the classics. Breeders Registry has been around for a long time. The first reported harlequin filefish spawning in captivity wasn't me. It was 1994 with someone in a 10 gallon tank uh, and it was posted to the Breeders Registry. Um, reef Builders, again, one of those places you'll hear about things first uh, are the various blog sites that are out there. Rareclownfish.com if you're into clownfish, seahorse.org if you're into seahorses, and Google is your friend. Google, 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 keep Googling. You will find more and more interesting things. Every time you just tweak that search or change a keyword, uh, use a lot of scientific names, you'll find breeding information uh, if it's out there. And then of course the MBI. And the MBI is the Marine Breeding Initiative. The MBI is a universal breed. It's really important to hit home that breeding the marine ornamental fish is beneficial, if not crucial, for the future of our hobby. Because again, I don't want to see this happen. I need to go on record and say we need wild caught fish for our brood stock. But we also 
need to make sure that if for some reason we can't get wild caught fish, we have a backup. Um, and I think we are in a time crunch because even, even just this year in Hawaii, the second really big push to try and shut down the Hawaiian fishery. That means any of those Hawaiian endemics, like the flame wrasse, wouldn't be available anymore. And the only way we would ever have flame wrasse is if Hawaii's collection was shut down, would be to breed flame wrasse. Um, so we really have to catch up. And the only way we catch up and get ahead of this is to start breeding like crazy. And the only way to really build on those successes is to not keep things closed down, to not be, oh, it's proprietary, I'm gonna make a fortune. You're not gonna make a fortune. Very few people, no one is making a fortune right now breeding marine fish. Could change in the future, but right now we're not there. So I don't want people to think, keep it to yourself, keep that latest success in. It's better and it's just for, for our common good, it's better to share what you learn. Um, and it's really important to hit home, I'm just gonna read it. Breeding of marine ornamentals receives almost no academic and governmental research funding, leaves the vast uh, expanse of opportunity to you, to the hobbyist, and it lets you guys make the impact. There's not tons of money being poured into research for marine fish. There is for food fish. We are very concerned about how we're gonna feed the world. We're not concerned with how we're gonna put fish in our, in our fish tanks as a society. So it really falls back to us, the people who do care, to make that cognizant decision that we're gonna do something about it. And captive propagation, again, it's the final frontier of the hobby. It's a rewarding way to take your hobby in new directions. If you're cutting up coral and fragging and fragging and fragging, we're all cutting up corals and fragging. It's been, we, we figured that out a long time ago. You wanna do something new, you wanna do something that's challenging, breeding fish is a great way to, to, to get that. Um, and it takes a lot less than you think. The biggest component out there is to start researching, start actively seeking out that information. Um, and then, this is my roadmap to get started. You wanna start with things that are easy, so you get that success and you learn the ropes. If you failed for three years in something, you are gonna walk away from it. But if you can have some success in the first year, that's gonna be enough to keep you going. It's always gonna be hard, especially if you keep on reaching higher and higher, it's gonna get harder and harder. But if you have some success and something to keep your interest going, it'll work out. And what you learn from breeding clownfish will help you avoid the mistakes you make early when you're trying something harder, when you're trying something like pygmy angelfish. So learn on something easy, don't just shoot straight for pygmy angelfish. Um, and then again, just some of the basic groups that are good for you guys to really start with. Bangai Cardinals, the Convict Worm Blenny, the Easy Seahorses, the Fang Blennies, the Clownfish, the Gobies, and the Pseudochromids. Those are really the, the best places for someone who's never spawned a fish to start. Uh, unfortunately, that's what a lot of people are already doing. So you might, you might jump a little higher than that if you want. Or if you pick a Pseudochromis, pick one that no one else around here is doing. Pick a clownfish species besides Ocellaris or Percula. There are Ocellaris and Percula to death. There are 30 some odd species of clownfish. And then most of those species have multiple geographic variants. There's so much more out there than another hybridized Percula, Ocellaris, crazy thing. There, there's a cinnamon clown from the Coral Sea where it's polymorphic population. Half the population doesn't have a head stripe, and half does. That's really cool, that's different. You don't see those every day. Seek that out, do that as a clownfish. Do something that other people aren't doing. And then just a special thanks to the people who uh, helped make this presentation possible, and for you guys for bringing me out today, and to Mike for having us, and uh, I will open it up to questions. Yes? Tell us a little bit about your setup. Uh, second presentation. Nope. <laughs> that, that is part of the second presentation. Uh, any other questions? Questions about specific fish? Um, problems you're having if you're trying to breed? Uh, would, would breeding stomatella snails be in that peppermint shrimp? How to train that? No, but breeding stomatella snails is almost like, like pouring water out of a jar. It's just put them in there and they'll do it. If you were going to do it for commercial, um, to try and rear them at a commercial scale, I don't know if anyone's doing that. It'd be, I mean, it'd be a great thing to just try. Say, so, you know, if, if that's your goal. I mean, it's one of the things that I, I'm working on a uh, future article is captive bred cleanup crews. Because we can actually breed uh, blue leg hermits, scarlet hermits, uh, a few of the various snails. There's a really great uh, columbellid snail that a couple guys in, in uh, Colorado uh, have kind of brought to the hobby. 
Uh, it's like a little mini conch. It's a great algae grazer. It produces lots of eggs. I've thrown them in some of my reefs and they just go. I don't have to replace Astraea snails or turbos or margaritas. Just put these snails in and they take care of it. So kind of like the stomatellus in that regard. Um, micro stars, those little mini brittle stars. I don't know how they are here. Every market's different. But back when I was in Chicago, I could bring a bag of a dozen of those and get $10 a bag to any frag swap I want to. And they'd be sold out in minutes. So I know it doesn't sound sexy to, to, to think about breeding things like Blue Lake Hermits. And it wouldn't make sense monetarily to breed Blue Lake Hermits right now. But in the future, it might. And it's also cool to just say, here's my Catherine Red Hermit crabs. Some people, you know, if, you're, if you really want to have a low impact or zero impact reef, Captain Bread Cleanup Crew would have to be part of that. So you could focus on peppermint shrimp, uh, all these other things I mentioned. And maybe price is not relevant to what wild is. Maybe you just ask the premium price that it would need to make it worthwhile. And Stomatellas, you tell me. Go try it and you tell me how to do it. You had a question. Uh, it might be part of your second presentation as well. But oh, the okay. Carlton uh, Dolphins. Oh, uh, what about them? Um, I've tried to breed them. I have, right now I just have one that I've had for about two years. Um, I was just curious if you could speak to more about what you did. Um, well, I mean, they went through a lot to get a good spawn pair. Um, I sold off extra brood stock because I was working at the time in a 700, 750 square foot condo in Chicago with six tanks. I had no room. I really had to pick and choose my breeding projects. Um, got that pair spawning. And that was just part, part of its luck. I got lucky. I got a good compatible pair. They ate like pigs after they were trained and, and just stuffed them full of food. The nice thing I've, I've learned is that something like the harlequin files really is a demanding species. The moment I moved to Duluth and had a son and wasn't going into the fish room five times a day, the few harlequin file fish I was still keeping really started to show and suffer and pairs that were compatible would stop being compatible. Uh, and then the, the subordinate fish would just go off of food really have to stay on top of them. They are very difficult fish to keep alive. I don't have harlequin files because I can't give them the care I know they need now. Uh, as far as the actual breeding, they would spawn in a patch of grassalaria, red grassalaria, and I would actually have to sit and watch when they actually spawn because they would spawn in a different place in the tank every day. So I'd have to know where they spawn because that was the only way I could go collect the eggs. The eggs are under a millimeter in diameter and green. So they blend in well with just about anything. So I'd actually have to go in, watch where they spawn, go in and suck the eggs out with the turkey baster, incubate them in a, I used a half gallon specimen cup, pump in the tank. And uh, they'd hatch in about 50 hours, 56 hours, move them into a larval rearing container. And I used um, initially a two gallon drum style fishbowl uh, with just a little bit of aeration in the corner to create uh, kind of like a chrysal, uh, create this circular flow. Um, uh, in my later attempts, I moved up to a four and found that that worked a lot better. Uh, it's harder to find a four gallon drum style. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that that mini chrysal, if you will, was put in a 10 gallon tank water bath to keep the temperature up. So we heated the 10 gallon tank, which heated up the, the fish bowl without actually having a heater in there. And then that got a water change every day to keep the water quality up in that in that incubator, if you will. Um, in about 48 hours, add in rotifers and just treat them like every other fish. Get the broodstock by themselves? No, the broodstock were in a reef tank full of other fish. Um, my thoughts on commercial culture would be that if this was a fish someone was going to try to do with serious intent to produce, you would treat them like you treat freshwater killifish, where you give them a, a single spawning site and you swap out the spawning site. So like, you could have yarn spawning mops. That's the only place in the tank that, that works for spawning. Don't give them anything else to spawn on. If they're gonna spawn, they'll spawn on that mop. You just swap out the mops every day. You incubate the mop. You don't have to even know if there are eggs there. If they're there, they'll hatch. And then you just get in a habit of rotation. Every day you're pulling mops. Then when you get the hatches, you'll start knowing they're spawning. And eventually, like I said, that's a species. It spawns every day when it's happy. So every day you'd be pulling a mop and having babies go, and then you just have to figure out how many you want to produce. Um, the big thing I found is that you need to start weaning them onto prepared foods in about four weeks. If you go beyond that, if you don't get them weaned by about week five, and this is going just off a few I did manage to rear, if you can't get them off of like baby brine shrimp by week five, that fish is dead. The fish is hooked on baby brine, baby brine isn't a good food. 
long term now, I'd probably say if maybe I could skip baby Brian, which we I introduced about the three week mark. Uh, if I could skip that and do something like copepods instead, that would probably be a better thing to do. Um, and again, getting them on prepared foods just as soon as possible. Once they hit like crushed spirulina flake for these guys was great. Once they hit that, they would grow like the wheat. And they were they were reaching mark a marketable size at like three and a half months. Any other questions? In your uh, black rearing tubs with your larvae so small, how are you handling water circulation and or filtration? Do you have some live rock in or do you have any, nothing? Any, any, nothing. 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 Um, the way you do it in a black round tub is you'll generally have uh, some sort of aeration to provide circulation and flow. Uh, usually, I like to offset it to the side, not in the center. Because what you'll do is you'll get kind of again that circular flow. That circular flow uh, creates gradients of current. So what happens if you? It's this thing I like to call a trout stream. Uh, if you watch how fish in a river tend to swim and feed and behave, they tend to find an area where they can almost glide. Just sit there and not really have to work hard to maintain their position and wait for the food to come to them. Wait for the, the current and the flow. Just bring it downstream and oh, there's something I'm going to eat. Go over and eat it and come back to that line sit there. And what happens in a black round tub when you get that circular flow going, you'll have areas of higher current and off to the sides you'll have areas of weaker current. And what it allows the fish to do is to find the current that works for what they want. That at this particular time this is too much current and move into a weaker current. And a lot of times what you'll notice is they move as a unit within this big expansive space they'll all be together because that particular spot in the larval rearing container is the perfect like micro habit or micro micro uh, environment that meets their needs at that point. And then when we combine that with green water, which changes the visibility and the way light penetrates the water, um, and also the light source above, the fish will move vertically in this way, horizontally, to be closer or further away from the light source. So that they can also find the right amount of light that they want, because light plays a very integral part in the larval rearing. Too much light, they all go to the bottom. Not enough light, they all go to the top. Light coming in from the sides, they get pinned to the sides because they're trying to get out. Um, so by having this, this di very dynamic and diverse environment in a black round tub, the babies figure out instinctively, this is the current I like, this is the water I like. They figure out how to root themselves. You give them just a, a broad array of choices and let them pick. Does that make sense? When you say aeration, rich in air in my tubing or an air stone or what? I, I use both. There's no right or wrong. Uh, and then as far as actual water quality maintenance, early on it's usually not a problem. Um, some of the newer products like uh, Rhodey Green, uh, you can just put uh, cultivated phytoplankton straight into the water. It's not live, so it won't affect water chemistry. It's relatively inert. So it's more likely going to just be eaten by the rotifers and coke pods that are in there. So that food won't really affect what's going on. The life in the, in the system still will, the baby fish and what they're eating. Um, usually we'll, we'll introduce something like sodium thiosulfate, so chloramex, a uh, an ammonia neutralizer, um, to, to keep ammonia under control. And then you can actually just do periodic water changes in the early stages, uh, later on, uh, You'll see it in my second presentation. You can actually put the larval rearing systems, these black round tubs,